Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be checking out the engineering behind Formula E. We'll be breaking down the science and strategy behind the battery, the motor, the transmission, the tires, the aerodynamics, the suspension, the brakes and regen, the cooling system, and of course the very unique aspect of the sport of having two cars per driver swapped mid-race. Starting with the battery, each car has 28 kilowatt hours of energy to be used. So each driver has in total 56 kilowatt hours to use in the race since there are two cars. The actual kilowatt hour rating of the battery is 32, but four kilowatt hours are used as a buffer to ensure the driver can still exit the track if they exceed the amount of energy they're allowed to use. The battery can send up to 200 kilowatts of power to the motor during qualifying, or 170 kilowatts of power during the race. The 170 kilowatt or approximately 230 horsepower electric motor used in season one of Formula E was developed originally for the McLaren P1 supercar and at its development it had the greatest power density of any automotive electric motor in the world with 8 kilowatts per kilogram. The regulations are now open so teams can use more than one motor if they'd like and develop the motors themselves. While the power output can never exceed 170 kilowatts during a race, you can alter the efficiency of the motor meaning you'll be able to run flat out longer than the other teams if your motor is more efficient. With the weight of the car, including the driver, at just 900 kilograms or under 2,000 pounds, the car can hit 100 kilometers per hour in just 2.9 seconds. The torque from the electric motors is sent through the transmission before reaching the rear limited slip differential. Gearing for the transmissions is now open. Some teams run just one gear, while others use up to a 5-speed sequential transmission, as was standard during the first season. Two, three, and four speed variants are open to use as well. It's likely that as the efficiency of the motors improve, that the number of gears will drop down to just one or two. The efficiency and torque output of the motors remains high, even at high RPM, so the added gears often just slow the car down with the added weight and more importantly the time required to shift gears. Some teams may choose to employ a two-speed strategy to optimize the standing start of the race. From the rear differential, for which torque vectoring is not currently allowed, the power of course meets the road via the tires. Tires here play a huge role in strategy. Each car has just one set of tires. These four tires are to be used in practice, qualifying, and the race itself so managing wear is critical. The tires are designed to perform well in both dry and wet conditions, so no tire changing is required as a result of the weather. If a team punctures a tire during the race, it essentially forfeits their race. While they are allowed to replace the tire with a leftover tire from the previous race, the time required to do so will cause them to come out behind the pack. Michelin has designed a tire not only to reduce the cost for the teams, but also to show what's possible from a performance standpoint with tire technology. Speaking with Mahindra's race engineer, he said that after the first two laps on the tire, its performance remains nearly constant throughout the race. To keep the tires planted on the ground, you might think these cars are running heavy downforce, as is the case in other open-seater races. While downforce is certainly helpful, Formula E is more about reducing drag. Teams tend to run higher downforce during qualifying in order to put down the fastest lap time, however they switch to lower drag setups for the race in order to manage energy. Remember, the more downforce, the more energy it takes to propel the car through the air. All of the teams run the same carbon fiber composite chassis and aero setup, however they can make angle changes to both the front and rear wings to optimize downforce for the track which they are competing at. If downforce isn't super strong, the cars will need to rely more on mechanics mechanical grip. Both spring rates and damping rates are open, and teams generally run a relatively softer setup to maximize traction. Because the aerodynamics are set up primarily for reduced drag, this allows for a softer setup without worrying about the car bottoming out while driving at high speeds, since the force pressing down on the car is low in comparison to other forms of motorsport. The teams can also alter wheel alignment as desired, and as you can see, the string method is just as popular in Formula E as it is in your garage. The carbon brakes are universal for all of the cars, but the regen system is not. The maximum rate of regen is 100 kilowatts, and this is essentially limited by the charge rate of the battery. Capacitors, which charge faster but store less energy, are currently not allowed, though they may be included in the future. With approximately 62% of the weight on the rear tires, the amount of energy which can be regenerated is significant but not always desired. There's a lot of strategy involved with regen. Too much regen upsets the balance of the car, altering the brake distribution and potentially locking up the rear tires under deceleration. 
Using significant regen also means a lot of heat is getting placed back into the battery, increasing the heat rejection requirements of the cooling system. Reducing regen can be a method used to keep the battery cool. Much like Formula One, the side pods house radiators for keeping the battery and powertrain cool. So long as ambient temperature remains relatively cool, around 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, cooling is generally not a major concern. As ambient temperatures rise, however, the driving strategy has to change. If the cell temperature of the battery reaches 62 degrees C, power is limited. If the cell temperature reaches 64 degrees C, the car stops. Cell temperature can be lowered by reducing regen initially and then reducing power delivery if temps continue to rise. An important part of the strategy is understanding that the cars cannot go flat out for the entire race, so energy management is critical to the driver. A failed attempt at overtaking means energy is wasted, and now the car ahead has more energy to further their lead. If a safety car comes out, which isn't all that uncommon considering these are street courses with minimal runoff areas, drivers can save a lot of energy. This may mean staying in one of the cars longer or using more energy towards the end of the race. Managing regen is also critical to allowing the car to drive with more power. Finally, the subject of two cars. With the batteries limited at 28 kilowatt hours, two cars are necessary to complete the race. But why not other solutions, such as battery swapping? Ultimately, it comes down to safety in multiple ways. If the battery is to be easily removable, there is a possibility that in the event of a collision, the battery could come loose, sending a massive, heavy, and obviously dangerous object through the air. In addition, the battery is used as a structural component, adding to the rigidity of the chassis, much like an engine in Formula 1. Having the battery remain in the vehicle allows for more flexibility in maintaining the structural integrity of the vehicle. As Formula E progresses in the future, the plan is to upgrade to a 54 kilowatt hour battery in Season 5 so the car lasts for the entire race. Of course, there will still be a requirement of the teams to manage their strategy from an efficiency standpoint to win the race. When to pass, when to save energy, such as in a pack of traffic, how much regen to use, and how to manage the tire degradation. I had a fantastic time watching the race in Long Beach and look forward to seeing how the series changes in the future and the innovation that continues with it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.